What is the deal with water? Why is it so complicated and why is it so expensive? I think it's one of the most expensive things on the farm to get right. Even fence, fence is nothing compared to water. We're passionate about farming, especially people who start farming in the middle portion of their life. And we don't want you to make the same mistakes, which is a code word for spending money that we did. So here are the seven tips after spending a bunch of money and a bunch of time installing water on our farm that will get you started with water on your farm and a more efficient watering experience for your livestock. Let's go. So here's tip one. It's all about the basics, honestly. Don't let water hold up you getting your first livestock. It's way more important to get livestock on your farm and learn that whole skill set, which is immense, <laughs> than to wait for the perfect water system. We're four years in and we're not even a quarter of the way done with our water system. So it's gonna take a while. What are the basics that you need? Well, basic number one would be the humble bucket. Now, I'm not above hauling water. We still haul water. Now we do it a different way nowadays, but a bucket with a lid, especially the type that has a gasket inside of it like that. I'll tell you what, you can put a bunch of these in a wheelbarrow. You can put a bunch of them in the back of a side-by-side. -side. You can strap them to the back of an ATV. It's a good way to haul water. Do you want to do it forever? No, but if you need to do it in a season just to get things going, go for it. If you do have larger animals that drink a lot of water, you have to have something to put the water into. They can't just drink out of a bucket. Maybe a goat could do that, but when you start getting into cattle and to a certain extent sheep, you need something larger. Water troughs come in all different shapes and sizes, but the water trough that we like the most is this Rubbermaid 55 gallon, see if I can show the whole thing, 55 gallon water trough by Rubbermaid Commercial, and they're low. They're maybe about, um, I don't know, 20 inches tall, as you can see, all right? And they hold 55 gallons of water, and they are tough. When we bought them a couple years ago, they were about 100 bucks a piece. They're probably more money now because it's 2025 and everything's more money. But get yourself a good water trough. Rubbermaid commercial, definitely the way to go. You're probably not going to find these at Tractor Supply. Go to an actual rural store, fencing store, that type of thing, and buy them. There is a difference. You don't want all your water leaking out. Just buy once, cry once, you'll be good to go. So we've got, you know, three or four of these that we have kicking around the farm. We live in the north and things do freeze. So we also have a way to get ice out of the water troughs. Now, we started busting ice off the top of our water troughs with a sledge, or sorry, with a, with a hatchet until I put a hole in the side of my water trough. And that was a major bummer. So uh, we don't do that anymore. But what you can do is just take a sledgehammer and you hold it by the handle, you know, upside down and you just drop it into the water trough and it busts the water up and you're good. To get the ice out so you don't freeze your hands, we took a shovel, like a little, uh, a little shovel that you'd use for, I think we bought this at Costco for digging out a car if you get stuck, for example. And I just drilled some holes in it so we can take the ice and we can scoop it out and the water goes away, but the ice stays on it. I know other farmers who take that same humble bucket, this guy, right? Take the same humble bucket, they drill holes in the bottom and they do the exact same thing. After you bust the ice, you wanna get it out of the water trough or else it just, it's like ice cubes in a water glass. It cools the water back down and it refreezes and it's a, it's a big bloody mess. So just get it out of there. That's all you need to get started. Oh, I forgot one thing, the hose, the most important part. We have become connoisseurs of hoses here on Lachlan Highlands Farm. I hate cheap hoses. When you buy a hose, buy either three quarters or five eighths diameter. Do not buy a half inch. There's just not enough flow in it. And when you start putting these things together, friction loss is a thing, as you'll learn later, and you're just not gonna get any water. It's not gonna go anywhere. Our favorite hose is the Gilmore Pro. And there's links down in the description for all this stuff on Amazon if you wanna grab it. But it's a great hose. We like them, we have a bunch. It kinda looks, you know, like, like this, okay? Now, there's some hose accessories we put on. I am a big fan of quick connects on things. So we have these quick connectors. Again, those are in the description link in Amazon. I, sometimes it's just easier instead of having to screw hoses together, you can quick connect them like that, okay? We have these on every hose on the farm. It's a good thing. We also have these little shutoffs because sometimes your water point so it's this little lever right here. It's like a ball valve, okay? I don't know if you can see that in there. Sometimes your water shutoff point, your main shutoff point is a long way away from where you are with the hose. And it's just really convenient to be able to turn the water off. 
So we have that shut off. We have quick connects on every hose and you're good to go, okay? You will also want hose repair parts. Occasionally, these things get busted. Do not get the ones with the hose clamps that clamp on. They're garbage, I hate them. Get the ones that, found it. Get the ones that look like this, that are the screw together type. So the screw together type that look like that, okay? So you've got barbs that go into either end of the hose and they screw together. They make the couplings like this for when you inevitably get a hole in the middle of the hose. They also make the ones that go on the end so you replace the end when you inevitably run it over and do all that stuff. So highly recommend it. Make sure you have a bunch of these on hands. So water trough, a way to get the ice out, buckets with lids, really good hose, hose repair parts, and quick connectors and shutoffs. You can do about anything from that point. Tip two is an easy one. Joel Salatin has a great philosophy when it comes to fence. He says to use a temporary fence in place for, I believe, three years before you make the commitment to put in a permanent fence. I think it's the same way with water. Water design is a lot. So once you figure out where the water is going to go, you have to get the water there. So you have to trench with an excavator, do all that stuff. You have to put pipe in the ground. You have to get the right size pipe. You have to backfill. Then you have to seed over what you trenched. And then you have to make sure that the, uh, that the hydrants installed correctly and you have to make sure that the water trough is on a level pad so you can use an auto filler. And then you have to figure out how to make the water run all the time. Is it solar, electric, blah, 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 whatever, right? It's a huge commitment to put in water. And when you do it, you wanna make sure you do it right. It took us a few years of just hauling water around to get the position of the water just where we wanted it. And I think we've got a pretty good setup to how we want it done. It's time efficient. It just works out well for us. So don't be in a rush to put in big infrastructure, especially the big ticket items like water. Give it some time, see where the water goes, see how many animals you have, let it figure itself out and then put the infrastructure in. Tip three is to be smart about hauling water. I'm 41 years old. I, and like, I get it. Like some people in the city, they do the CrossFit thing and they do farm fit or whatever that's called. We did that one at one point. When you have to do it twice a day, 365 days a year, because your animals keep drinking water, it gets old after a while, and I'm not 20 years old anymore. So, you know, I have a job, and equipment is something that I can afford. So hydraulics and diesel power make my 41 years of age more like a 18 years of age. Let me show you what I mean. Our primary method of hauling water on the farm is a Kubota X1100C, I believe it is, uh, with a custom-built water trailer that I built and I put on the back of it. So I can haul 150 gallons of water anywhere, and as long as I have a generator, that pump right there, which is an um, irrigation pump for like sprinklers, for people who have sprinklers in their yard, I can pump that water into any container pretty darn quickly. Now, this is my preferred way to do it, just because the Kubota has such low impact on the land. It's a heavy-ish machine, heavier than an ATV, but remember, 150 gallons of water at eight and a half pounds a gallon, I don't do math in public, but you've got a thousand pounds roughly behind this, uh, this Kubota. The Kubota weighs about a thousand pounds, so that's a nice match to be towing around. I've tried towing that with the ATV. It, it works, but if you get going down a hill and you get going fast, uh, I hope your insurance is paid and you talk to the father today. The other way we haul water is with IBC totes, 275 gallons. You can get these things, they're still pretty reasonable. You gotta look around for the food grade ones that have been washed out, that's our preference. But they work great. And I've got a John Deere 85 horsepower tractor with a big lift on the front. And that lift can lift 3,000 pounds. So that's a lot of water. Tip four is to have a grazing plan and to design your infrastructure around that grazing plan. On our farm, we have pretty much divided everything up into separate paddocks at this point. And our goal is to have permanent water in each paddock for all of our animals. So there's a lot of design criteria that go into that. We had to figure out how to get water out of our pond, which we do with the solar pump because we don't have electric down there. We had to figure out, out what trough height would work for the type of animals that we, that we water. We use 300 gallon, I think it's high ridge plastics, uh, 20 inch tall troughs. We use big water troughs because we're pumping with solar, which means we can't pump when we have a bad solar day. It's super cloudy or it's nighttime. So we have really big water troughs to uh, scale with our farm and the number of animals that we plan on having. And we want to put two water points in each farm or in each pasture because we know how we divvy those pastures up and how we want to 
uh, water animals and when we do our rotational grazing system. So we came up with the grazing patterns first and how we separated all of our paddocks and how we uh, did the big separations with the fields on our farm. We hauled water to the places where we thought it would be most useful based on how we were setting up our daily paddocks or, or hourly paddocks. And then we trenched in water line and built the final infrastructure. Tip number five is to make level watering pads for your water trough. And if you're like us, we live on everything but flat. Everything around here is a hill. There is a lot of difference between the upside of that water trough and the downside of it. If I remember correctly, I think it was something like 18 inches that we had to compensate for. The problem when these things aren't level, if you can see the level of the water across the top here, if you get your water kind of cattywampus, then you're never gonna put enough water into your trough and it's gonna spill out and it's gonna be a big pain in the butt. So these troughs, we want as much water in them as we can get. These are the 300 gallon water troughs I was talking about. So we took the time, the effort, the energy to build the infrastructure to make these level and put them on level pads. Uh, also these heavy use rock pads. Again, we took the idea from Mr. Judy, keep our cattle from tearing up the ground around the pad when the water is uh, splashing out, which cattle are off to do because cattle love to play in the water. So it just helps keep our land in a little bit better shape, which is a, a good thing. So level up those water pads, people. Tip number six, don't undersize your water pipe. I found out the hard way, there is such a thing called friction loss with water. So if you've ever connected together a bunch of little hoses, and this is why I don't like those half inch hoses like I talked about earlier in the video, um, there's friction when the water goes through the hose. And if the hose diameter is too small, if you connect up, you know, I don't know, 500 feet of half inch hose, it doesn't matter how much pressure you put in on the faucet side, water is not coming out the other end. There's just too much friction to actually stop the water, which is crazy. And the same thing applies to pipe that you put underground. When I did the calculations, and I had rural power systems help me out with this, but I also verified it uh, with Google. As it turns out, for 1,000 foot or 1,500 foot runs, which we're doing with our permanent water system when we're trenching in, we need inch and a half diameter pipe, which, you know, if you, if you look at it, this is not small pipe. Uh, so inch and a half diameter, you can see kind of the size of it. That's some legit pipe. The problem is that friction. So when you take friction losses into account, if your pipe diameter is too small, you're not gonna see anywhere near that amount of pressure, you'll have pressure drop. It said we had to use inch and a quarter pipe. The next size up I could get was inch and a half. And even on the far end of the field down there where we're 1500 feet away from the pond and we have to go up, oh, about 50 feet of elevation gain, we get pretty darn good pressure. So do your engineering, make sure you've got all your valves, don't cheap out on the components, get brass connectors, get good quality pipe, all that stuff, because when you put it in the ground, the last thing you wanna do is be digging it back up. Tip seven, power is everything. And as you move up the, I guess, infrastructure ladder and you start putting in this really expensive infrastructure, the first thing you have to figure out is where you're gonna get your water from. In our case, it's a big pond, about a quarter acre pond. The second thing is, where's my power gonna come from to get water out of that pond? Now, we wanna pipe this water all over the farm, so we have to pump it, and pumps require a lot of power. So what we did is put in this Rural Power Systems RPS 400 pump system, solar pump system. And it works out really, really well. But holy moly, was it expensive in terms of money and time. But the alternative would be, well, nothing. We, there's no electrical service out here anywhere nearby that we can run power down to the pump in the lake. So solar power it is. Now, we do have uh, a generator as a backup. And this little Honda generator, these things are fantastic. I highly recommend them. It's the best generator money can buy, honestly. I, when you look at the order of precedence for power, if you have an existing power hookup, that's awesome. If you don't have that, can you power it off of a generator for a little while? That's not a bad idea. That's what we use with our water wagon. Uh, solar would be another good option. It's very expensive, but unless you have batteries on your solar system, you still need to have a generator backup for it to make that work. Let me show you what we did with ours. It's kind of neat. As the saying goes, one is none and two is one. So we always believe in having redundant power backups. And as you can tell from the sky behind me, this is Ohio, it's getting ready to storm. We sometimes see the sun in Ohio. It's, you know, an occasional thing. Having generator backup for the solar system that pumps all of our water is a big deal. So I put this receptacle on the outside of the control box for the solar power. There's an inverter inside of this box here. And I can hook up the generator with a special cable that I built and uh, in the winter, we can just run the whole thing, you know, off of this generator. It's a great thing to have. 
if you're interested in how we designed this entire thing, I have a playlist called the Eastern Pasture Water System. And I'll put it on the screen now so you can look at it. I detail everything, and it's still an ongoing project for us, but we go through this whole installation of the RPS 400 from rural power systems, uh, trenching, putting the pump in the lake, all that good stuff. So thank you for watching. We love you guys, and God bless you. Thank you so much for giving us all this time, and uh, good luck on your farm, and we'll see you soon.